Mm, Florida man right there. <laughs> yep. Uh, so thank you for joining us. My name is Jason Blanchard. I'm the Content Community Director here at Black Hills Information Security. We're joined here today with Bill Bullock. If you didn't join us for the pre-show banter, well, you can always join us next time. We show up 30 minutes early because you, some of you show up early because we show up early. It's, it's a vicious cycle. That's fun. Yeah, it's fun. It, I, I've been on other webcasts where like it's just dead silent and then all of a sudden like, Hello, Welcome everybody. to the webcast from Black Hills Information Security. Today, we're going to, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. That's fine. Uh, but we got Bo here today, and I'm going to just tell the story real quick because it will lead into Bo, and I know he's got a lot of stuff to cover. But essentially, we're doing this because Bo was trying to explain blockchain and smart contract auditing to me. And if you could have seen the look on my face, it was like, <laughs> just kind of glazed over. <laughs> it's just, please. And I was like, I, I really need like a getting started and uh, please take me back to the basics. And so yeah. Bo's like, oh, I can do that. And so a month later, he has this webcast. We're going to do it for you today. Uh, so if you have any questions about blockchain, smart contract auditing, we're going to try to answer them today. But it will be at the end, but you can ask them anytime. We'll save them. We'll store them to the side. And then we'll get back to them as soon as we can. And we might go into like extra innings or something here at the end just depending on how many questions we have. Last thing, if you ever need a pen test, red team threat hunts or sock or anything like that, you know where to find us. And with that, Bo, it's all yours. Thanks, Thank you. Jason. All right, everyone ready? Let's, let's go. Uh, so this webcast is on getting started in blockchain security and smart contract auditing. Um, so this is meant to be a primer, um, like, like, like Jason just mentioned, for understanding some of the underlying issues around uh, blockchain security specific to smart contracts, which I'll get into. Um, there's actually a number of other elements in this entire you know, blockchain ecosystem outside of smart contracts, but we'll get to those as well. Um, I'm going to walk through some of the reasons that I think uh, blockchain security is important and, and kind of why this talk is even uh, a thing, um, as well as some case studies into some of the major hacks that have happened. Um, so we're gonna, I'm going to show you some examples of some real world things that have happened. I'm going to show you how uh, a project got hacked for $600 million um, just because a few lines of code uh, were, were vulnerable. Um, it's going to be an exciting talk. <laughs> um, I'm also going to kind of walk through what smart contracts are and kind of give it like a primer into auditing smart contracts and how to find vulnerabilities. Um, I'm also going to do a live demo. Um, so I did I did actually sacrifice a couple chickens um, earlier. So hopefully the demo goes well. Um, we we will see how it goes. <laughs> All right. So without further ado, let's get started. Um, quick note about me. Um, I'm Bo Bullock. I'm a pen tester, red teamer here at Black Hills. Um, I'm also the author and instructor of a uh, cloud hacking training course called Breaching the Cloud. Um, also a, ho a host of a podcast uh, that we have called the CoinSec Podcast, which is a weekly show where we kind of walk through uh, a lot of the, the larger security issues around blockchain and cryptocurrency in general. Um, I, you know, spoken at a few different conferences. I'm also, I also write some music. Um, so I do some, some synthwave metal, um, that is under a project that I call no bandwidth that is out there. Um, which it, honestly, if you ever want to use it, like as background music, feel free to use it. You have my permission. <laughs> like you do YouTube videos, Gerald was just ask, asking, um, actually to use it. Um, so I think it's awesome. Like feel free if you ever want to use any of that stuff. All right. So roadmap for today. Um, first section that I'm gonna be walking through is why Blockchain security is important. Um, kind of give you a high level overview of why 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 do we need to worry about this? Why is this something that should be on our radar? I'm gonna give you an introduction to smart contracts. Um, you know, the, the term blockchain tends to get a bad rap alongside, you know, like uh, buzzwords, you know, AI, machine learning. I see people all the time in the security industry just kind of disregarding it um, because of that, that kind of buzzwordiness around it. But I'm gonna show you today that a lot of organizations are implementing. Uh, blockchain within their various projects. And it's something that if we don't start, you know, paying more attention to the security issues, it, these hacks are just going to continue. Um, and uh, it's something that we need to kind of step forward and, and start to proactively start fixing. <laughs> um, like I said, I'm going to do some hack case studies. We'll do a smart contract actual exploit. So I'll show you how one of these exploits actually looks in the real world, um, how, you know, some of these, these projects are getting hacked and how tokens are being stolen. And then finally, I'm going to leave you with some additional resources to kind of get started um, if you are interested in kind of jumping into doing auditing. So why blockchain security? 
So this is the first slide that I think it, it should be something to just kind of take in. Just kind of take in this slide for a second there. So this is why blockchain security. Um, so in less than a year's time, more than $1.2 billion has been stolen from smart contract based projects um, that that are you know on top of various blockchain infrastructure. So a lot of these projects are various you know exchanges and other sort of blockchain based projects where they are implementing use cases and um, using smart contracts as the underlying technology, which I'll again, I'll get into what that actually is in a moment. Um, and the thing is that a lot of times the smart contracts it literally takes one or two lines of code that are vulnerable. And in those cases where they're vulnerable, um, it results in these major, major hacks that just drain these massive amounts of funds for projects. Um, one of the cases that I'm going to walk through later on today is the, the first example there, Poly Network, over $600 million stolen from one single uh, project. Um, you know, just, just kind of think about like those numbers for a second, right? Because like, you know, Colonial Pipeline, when they, they had the ransomware attack, um, the ransom was less than $5 million. But most of these exploits that have occurred against smart contract projects are a lot higher than that. So in addition to, you know, smart contracts, there, there's growing use cases for just blockchain in general. So, you know, first and foremost, you know, uh, Bitcoin was the first, uh, you know, decentralized currency, right? And that's that's kind of been the primer of where a lot of this industry has kind of grown off of, right? Um, so, you know, started with currency, but off of that, um, a number of different projects have started building out different use cases. So, for example, decentralized finance or DeFi is a huge, huge industry right now um, that is booming. That basically facilitates peer-to-peer -peer transactions um, without a middleman. So you have like these exchanges where you can um, you can interact with other people directly through a smart contract, as opposed to going through like a bank. Then there's um, digital identity. Uh, so you know some projects are looking at tracking identity on the blockchain. Um, like for example, uh, some 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 websites that are implementing Web3 and and uh, interacting with like MetaMask wallets allow you to authenticate using your private key. Uh, of your wallet itself um, that kind of tracks who you are. Non-fungible tokens, uh, you know, NFTs are, you know, hugely exploding as well uh, in popularity. Um, supply chain tracking, media, so anti-piracy, this is a kind of interesting use case. So I saw um, Disney is actually using blockchain to help prevent movie piracy. And so the way they're doing that is basically by limiting the amount of playback time in theaters. So like they would provide, um, you know, a, a blockchain-based solution to prevent piracy, which is kind of interesting. So anyways, the, the point of the slide is to kind of show like outside of just currency, right? Like, so a lot of people understand and, and recognize that like the word blockchain is kind of synonymous with, you know, cryptocurrency. Um, but in addition to that, people are building these other projects on top of it that's leading to more and more use cases. So, you know, with that, it, it is kind of a new frontier because people are still trying to figure out what to do with it, right? People are still trying to understand where where is it, you know, the right place to use it. Where is it not? You know, where can I just use a database instead? Um, you know, there's a lot of times where people are like, oh, maybe I should use blockchain for that because it's a cool hip word, you know. Uh, but in fact, like, really, all you needed was a database. Um, but if you ever needed something that was truly decentralized, um, blockchain might be the the right solution for that. So, with this being kind of a new frontier, the thing is that you have a ton of projects that are just racing. Um, to be first to market. And that leads to really, really big issues because you have companies that are just trying to get their project out there um, without actually implementing strong security as, as a base layer. They're, they're more interested in actually just getting to market, which, um, you know, it, it's something that's happened throughout history, you know, throughout, you know, computer security history, you have a lot of companies that are just trying to be first to market. And in a lot of traditional, you know, IT cases or in computer science cases in general, um, you don't have this major risk factor of if you have this one tiny little vulnerability, it's just going to wreck your project. You know, like if you build a web application, um, you know, sure, you have to worry about, you know, hacks of, of the web app to make sure people don't get to the back end database, but typically it doesn't result in you, you know, losing millions and millions of dollars, right? Um, but with that being said, you have you have these established well-known companies now, so like Microsoft, IBM, I mentioned Disney, Walmart, um, that are implementing different use cases outside of just you know the public blockchains that you're aware of. So things like um, you know Bitcoin, Ethereum. Um, I'll talk about a number of other ones throughout this talk. 
those are you know public blockchain solutions but there's also private blockchain solutions where companies can actually implement their own private blockchain i'll show you an example later on today um, about how like how easy it is to just kind of deploy your own private blockchain um, so more than just smart contract security though too so you know like this talk um, throughout the most of this the today is going to be primary primarily built around smart contract security uh, because that tends to be where the brunt of the exploits are happening um, but in addition to that this entire ecosystem is huge there's a lot of different elements at play here so first off we have layer one which is the underlying blockchain protocol itself um, so the 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 actual software layer right so if we look at like um like the actual software running on systems that is managing the decentralized network itself so like bitcoin core or go ethereum geeth is another uh client that runs the ethereum network for the most part these are software pieces that just run on computers around the world that sync the blockchain for whatever uh whatever um blockchain tech it is so like if it's eth you're probably running um geeth like for example i have an ethereum node here um that runs geeth and so like these these pieces of software get vulnerabilities too there was one just like uh a couple weeks ago um that caused a fork in ethereum and i was actually hit by it too um and i was i, I was watching because i have um have a grafana dashboard where i can actually see all the blocks happening and i was actually watching and i could see where um you know it was actually being exploited so you know, that's layer one, that's the low, low layer, low level layer blockchain, right? Layer two is in, like a step above that, like an abstracted layer, just right on top of layer one, that typically a lot of layer two solutions these days focus on scalability. So um, an example of this is the Bitcoin Lightning Network. And one of the biggest problems that um, Bitcoin transactions face is speed. Um, so what they have, what they have ended up doing is trying to abstract those transactions out to a second layer where they're actually in um, facilitating peer-to-peer -peer transactions and then resolving it later on on layer one um, so this is like a second layer on top of the underlying layer one technology smart contracts is what we're going to dive into today so smart contracts are these they're, they're programs they're software programs that get deployed to a blockchain um, these are like when you hear somebody talk about a token or a de decentralized application or nfts um, like you know nfts are hugely popular right now those are tied to a smart contract somewhere on the blockchain um, then we'll you know another another element outside of you know these first three layers um, software wallets and hardware wallets um, so what i've I've done another webcast, and I think we actually have a blog post on um, the Black Hills site uh, where I kind of talked about, you know, securing coins and stuff, um, which, you know, you have the the option of either being in custody of your own uh, cryptocurrency with um, a non-custodial wallet where you're actually in control of it, or actually using an online uh, custodial-based wallet. Um, or, you know, you have hardware wallets too. So these are physical devices for storing private keys um, that are then used to send and receive funds. Um, in general, the, you know, we recommend that you would store your own keys and you protect them yourself because the, the thing that um, is a really big problem with, with how a lot of cryptocurrency works is that if you don't control your keys and you let an exchange control them and that exchange gets hacked, um, it's just gone. There is no insurance. There's no way to get it back. So as long as you control your private keys, you are in control of the funds. Um, and then you have mining software. So another big element to the blockchain ecosystem is mining of, of the tokens themselves. And so these are specialized uh, hardware and software that does the mining. Um, and then centralized versus decentralized exchanges. This is another big element. Um, so centralized typically you require uh, uh, know your customer KYC, which is you know your sites like Coinbase, Binance, um, some of the bigger exchanges out there. Decentralized exchanges are what we're going to kind of focus on um, when we talk about smart contracts. Is D, you know DeFi, decentralized finance. These are exchanges that are built on a smart contract deployed to a blockchain that users can interact with while ever going through a centralized entity. Um, and then one of the the most important elements, people, right? So social engineering. This is. This is one of the reasons that I think that um, the blockchain gets a bad rap, um, and it's it's due to all the scammy uh, things that happen. A lot of the a lot of the what are called rug pulls that happen um, in in the blockchain ecosystem, where you know um, an organization may try to get investors in their project, and then they just you know run away and steal it and make it look like a hack. Uh, so that happens, and and you know that that can kind of tend to give 
um, blockchain bad name too. So with that being said, um, you know, like there's all these elements, but we're going to focus on smart contracts for today. So um, I really like this quote. Um, I think this is probably one of the best ways that I've seen uh, smart contracts defined from a risk perspective. Um, so this is a quote from the book Mastering Ethereum um, by Andreas Antonopoulos and Dr. Gavin Wood. And essentially what this quote says is that you can't you can't develop smart contracts using the traditional software development uh, life cycle that, you, that you're used to. Um, like you can't just like think like, oh yeah, we'll just patch that in the future if it doesn't work. You have to apply rigorous engineering and software development methodologies as you would to aerospace engineering, you know? So like, if you're gonna build a plane, um, you don't just like say, oh yeah, that, um, you know, that wing issue, we'll just patch that in the future sometime. No, you have to make sure everything's gonna work successfully before you actually launch it because one of the the biggest uh, things to to be concerned with with smart contracts is that they are immutable. So, what does immutable mean? So, immutable means that once it's deployed to a blockchain, it can be changed, and this creates a number of problems, right? So, a a program, right? Like think about like a software program that you're used to running. You know, um, typically, if there's a vulnerability that gets exposed in that that piece of software then the, the uh, manufacturer will go patch it and you'll be good to go. So the thing is with, with the nature of blockchain is that once you deploy something, it is there forever. It, that's, the whole, that's the nature of blockchain, how it works. It's, it's supposed to be there um, unless you actually go in and destroy the contract, um, which is possible. Um, or there are, there are ways to actually create what are called proxy contracts, which actually allow you to do kind of like a pseudo upgrade, which I'll talk about later on too. Uh, but for the most part, the contracts that you deploy cannot be modified. So to, to kind of like grasp what's happening here, um, take a traditional program, deploy it to a decentralized blockchain, um, and now you have this, this program that users can interact with that is decentralized around the world. Um, it's not just on a centralized computing system. Um, and these, these uh, contracts, they actually get... Um, executed within virtual machines via the node software. So I mentioned Geeth earlier, um, the, node, the node software. Um, so these contracts are typically written in high-level languages, which I'll show you some examples here in a second. Um, and then they get compiled into bytecode. So whenever a smart contract is deployed to a blockchain, it actually gets compiled down into bytecode uh, language prior to actually being deployed. Um, so the thing is that that bytecode is actually something you can visibly see on the blockchain as well, um, so it, it's it's um, it's still possible to go and kind of reverse engineer the bytecode um, after it's been deployed to the blockchain too. Uh, but in most cases, in most cases, the the developers of smart contracts tend to open source and publish their code publicly as well. Um, and these smart contracts they only run if they're actually called by transactions. So you can deploy them; they will sit there. And unless you've actually sent a transaction, they're just going to stay there. So where do these run, right? Um, with, on the Ethereum network, right? If we're, we're talking specifically about Ethereum, um, there's this thing called the Ethereum virtual machine. Now, Ethereum itself, right? It's a blockchain protocol that it's, it's similar in nature to Bitcoin. But the big difference is that with like Bitcoin, the primary mechanism for it is to function as a decentralized ledger of transactions, right? So... The whole point of Bitcoin is basically to, tra to, to track the entire history of all transactions that have ever happened on the Bitcoin blockchain. Ethereum also, in addition to tracking the transactions, has added a state machine um, in addition um, so that whenever a smart contract is executed, it will actually store a state on the blockchain as well. And it uses opcodes to execute these tasks. Now, one of the ways that, they, that they've kind of implemented a, a way to kind of prevent, you know, just having a contract that just loops endlessly forever and, you know, would just kind of denial of service is to, um, they implemented this thing called gas. And so every single execution, every single task that a contract performs has a cost. And so it would actually take monetary backing to create some sort of endless loop, right? Um, which is, you know, Attackers are not incentivized to do that. Um, but anyway, so the EVM is a, it's a virtual machine that you have both volatile state and a persistent state. So 
you can think of it like a traditional um, like computing system when it comes to uh, how the memory is stored and how storage is stored. Um, so you can actually have like persistent long-term storage that happens on the blockchain, or you can have uh, tasks that execute in memory um, that don't actually get stored to the blockchain. Um, and the the thing with um, that's kind of interesting with smart contracts is that, um, or not just smart contracts in general, but in, in, with Ethereum is that you can have accounts that are both uh, or that can be either externally owned, which means that they're kind of like your traditional um, like user account. So like if I you know create a new wallet, that's that's considered like an externally owned account um, or contract accounts. So this is this becomes really important because contract accounts and externally owned accounts both look pretty similar uh, when it comes to the addresses. They you can't you wouldn't be able to tell them apart when it comes to an actual address. Um, and that will become important later on because you can actually utilize contracts as an attacker. Um, you can deploy your own contracts to attack uh, existing contracts. All right, so so how do you write a smart contract? All right, so Solidity is the, the primary language currently um, and the most utilized language for writing smart contracts. It is a, a high-level language, very similar to JavaScript or C++. Um, like I said, by far, like the most dominant currently. Um, and it's it's something that I'll show you a few other languages here in a second, but um, it's something that you know right now this is the most dominant one. But just be aware that there are others too, and keep in mind that when you write this code, um, it's ultimately going to get compiled down to bytecode anyway. So uh, one of the IDs that I'll show you later on um, in the demo is Remix ID. So this is a good um, uh, ID for developing smart contracts. Um, I mentioned earlier that the code tends to be posted publicly, um, and, and the reason is for a, few, for a few different reasons, right? So, one thing that is very common throughout um, the smart contract world is that trust is of utmost importance, and to to create that trust, a lot of projects decide to post their code publicly and they verify it. So. Um, one of the the main ways that you can go and actually kind of track transactions is through a um, an explorer uh, like Etherscan. So there are these explorers where you can actually you know input a contract address or a wallet address and kind of see all the transaction history that's happened with it. Um, in addition to the bytecode that is connected to a smart contract, and if a and if the person who created that smart contract has actually gone and verified their code, you can actually see the verified code there as well. Um, so it will it will match up with the byte code, um, and you can trust that what you see in, in the in the smart contract code that's pu posted publicly is what's actually being executed. And and this is this is important because, like I said, there's a lot of cases right now where um, <clears throat> there's a lot of scams happening, rug pulls, um, and as a user of these different um, contracts. You want to be aware of of what you're using, and so it's it's out there so that you could actually audit it yourself, um, similar to you know just using open source code, right? Um, but it does help kind of expose those potential vulnerabilities and backdoors. All right, so this is an example, um, just a quick kind of like example to show you what Solidity, Solidity looks like. Um, first, we have the compiler version at the top. Um, so this is just specifying which Solidity compiler version we're going to compile with. This is an example faucet contract. So what a faucet is, is um, basically what it sounds like, right? So it's a faucet that will like drip a certain amount of a token out. Um, and the idea here is that you would fund this faucet with a certain amount of uh, of a token or coin, and then you know users of this faucet could get you know a little bit of that um, when if they needed to use it. This is actually a really common occurrence on a lot of the test networks. So in Ethereum, you have um, a number of test networks out there, and that will help you facilitate testing out very smart contracts. And instead of paying with real money um, on these test networks, there are faucets that will actually drip little you know small amounts of, of coins for you. And so this is an example. I'm um, just kind of show you what it looks like real quick. So a contract um, called Faucet. Um, it is a payable contract. So it means that we can actually send uh, we can send coins to this contract directly. It has a single withdraw function um, here that is public, specified public, meaning that we can interact with it um, publicly. Anyone can interact with this function. Um, and then there is a, a limit to what you're allowed to withdraw. Um, so we could specify a withdraw of uh, this is in this is in wave format, which I believe this is like 0.1 ether. Um, if you actually converted it to to ether, 
and then it will actually just transfer it out to the to the message sender. So whoever interacted with it. Um, so this is a really basic example, but to give you an idea of you know what smart contracts are, this is a smart contract, right? This is this is it's a very basic you know um, short example, uh, but this is what it looks like, right? And this is the type of thing that um, a lot of a lot of companies are building, and they're making these massive contracts that are similar to these. Um, and it's deployed to a blockchain where you can actually interact with it um, from a decentralized perspective. So I mentioned, you know, Solidity is not the only one, right? So right now, it's kind of like 1980s Apple versus Microsoft um, in the blockchain technology world. We have all these different blockchains that are competing um, to be the most efficient and innovative. Um, so you have, you know, obviously, like I'm sure most of you have heard of Bitcoin. And, um, you know, I'm talking about Ethereum today. Um, but you also have Solana. Um, which, you know, this, there's smart contract capabilities for Solana, Cardano um, is pushing out smart contract capabilities. Um, but my point with this slide is that um, when you look at developing or auditing smart contracts, um, just understand that there are, it, there's not just one language, right? There's not just one blockchain. There are all these ones competing and, and where this actually goes is to be determined, right? Like who, who ends up being the winner is still to be determined. Um, on, on you know which one's the most efficient, which one's the most innovative. It's something that um, that we're gonna just have to to see where it goes. But honestly, learning what the vulnerabilities are uh, in regards to what are some common issues, it, I think is gonna translate well across the different languages. Um, it'll be it'll be something that you have to kind of um, you know kind of I, I identify similar you know, nature within the code itself, whenever you look at other languages, but um, the underlying concepts, which I'm gonna show you some of them today, um, will likely be fairly similar. So um, smart contract vulnerabilities. Now we're kind of getting into the brunt of the security aspect. Now we kind of have like a very you know high level, hey, here's blockchain, here's smart contracts. Let's talk about some of the vulnerabilities and how some of these projects are getting hacked. So smart contract vulnerabilities, um, the, the biggest, the, the most important thing here is that they typically result in a significant loss of funds. And it's, it, it, it's because you have all these projects that are jumping in, trying to ha be first to market, you know, getting funding, you know, hyping different projects and whatnot. Um, because, you know, I mean, to, to be, to be blunt, I mean, or blunt, there's, there are um, a lot of people that are that see it as like kind of an investment world, right? Uh, but if you kind of like abstract yourself from the investment side of it for a second and just look at the technology, um, it's it's interesting stuff. You know, if you don't even actually like pay attention to like the monetary side of it at all, um, the fact that you can execute these smart contracts decentralized. So I can literally I have like a computer in my house that runs Ethereum software. I can interact directly with that Ethereum node, um, and anything I do interacting with that node will get actually copied and distributed to every single other node. Um, so you can have these applications that are just decentralized from everything else. Um, so you don't have to go to like any centralized website to do that. You can host an entire website um, using using uh, using smart contracts, decentralized. So you can interact with it on the node itself. You can actually use um, IPFS, so the interplanetary file system to host code files. You can use, um, there's ENS, so the Ethereum name service is just like DNS um, in the traditional world except for uh, contract uh, uh, addresses. Um, so you can actually have like an ENS name that points to the files on IP. It's, it's really interesting because like you can actually have like a client locally to interact with these. Anyways, um, <laughs> looking at the vulnerabilities though is what we're about today. That's what that's why we're here. So since contract code is public, anyone can analyze it for issues. So this becomes you know very important that when you publish this stuff uh, you know, publicly, um, you don't have any have any issues because, um, as an attacker, so this is this is one of the interesting things about about smart contracts is that as an attacker, I can build my own public or I'm sorry, my own private um, network of of nodes that I can actually test these contracts against, or I can do it against test networks. So there's public test networks out there um, that you can actually deploy contracts to and test out exploits. So if the project's code is public, right? Then I can go deploy it on my own system, and then try to you know find vulnerabilities and attack it locally. Um, and then this this is how a lot of the exploits happen, right? Like the attackers will go pull the public code down, um, deploy deploy it locally, and then write exploits for that contract, and then go attack it publicly. So 
Um, you know, this is another topic of um, of uh, of conversation, but um, you know, the the whole idea of monitoring, right? And and how could you potentially like monitor somebody trying to attack your contract and stop it is is you know another conversation, um, which we we talk about some of this stuff on the podcast on the Coin podcast. So. Um, if you ever want to come on and chat about that kind of thing, definitely let me know. <laughs> um, so the other big thing here is that no patching, right? So since contracts are immutable, you can't go and patch them. You can kind of do like a pseudo patching though. So you can create proxy contracts um, that are basically like a front user facing contract um, that store the state and they point to the actual uh, contract on the backside. So if you were to find a vulnerability, you could actually deploy a new version and then modify the proxy contract to point to the new one. Uh, but that still doesn't necessarily mean that the, that that old contract can't be interacted with. So, um, you know, and the other big thing too, right? Stolen funds can be very difficult to track, <laughs> which um, is, you know, another conversation. Uh, maybe that that's another webcast in, in and of itself is tracking transactions. All right, so let's dive into some of the, the vulnerabilities and, and what we're looking at here. Because I think I think these really, to me, like when I first started looking at smart contract vulns, this is what really got me interested: is how some of these vulnerabilities actually manifest themselves and um, and how how to go about exploiting them. So one of the more popular ones um, is is called reentrancy. So one of the things that's that's fascinating is that as an attacker you can actually deploy your own contracts, right? So you can deploy your own smart contracts to the, to the blockchain that interact with existing contracts. And what reentrancy basically is, is, it's a vulnerability where the contract that, that you're targeting has a function that allows um, for, let's say, withdrawing ether, right? So like you, 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 you know, maybe you've, you've stored something, um, like a stored a, a certain amount of ether in this contract for whatever purpose, and you're going to pull it out. Um, if that contract doesn't actually update the balance of your account within that contract's context, prior to actually calling and sending you that ether, there may be a reentrancy issue where you could actually have it withdraw it to your own smart contract and have it actually execute um, a, a fallback function in your contract. So whenever a, a, a contract calls a function that doesn't exist, um, a fallback function can be created so that it, you know, it, it says, hey, oh, that function you call doesn't actually exist. Let's run the fallback function. So the fallback function in your attacker contract would simply just call that withdraw balance again. And you create this loop where basically you're like, oh, I'm withdrawing prior to it updating in the contract, call my function in my attacker one, then call the withdraw again, then call my, my function, then withdraw again until it just drains everything. And so this is reentrancy. Um, and I'm going to show you an example of this um, later on today, too. Another um, big topic is uh, front running. So what front running is, is um, so so with, with blockchain technology, <clears throat> whenever you submit a transaction, that transaction actually stays in this place called the mempool for a little bit before it actually gets mined. And so the mempool is like, um, like in this example here, you see this box, right? So all these transactions get posted to the mempool and miners, so the, the ones that are actually validating transactions can decide on, on which transactions they want to go mine. Uh, and typically it's, um, it's kind of like a who pays the most gets their priority uh, of, of who actually gets uh, mined first. So if, for example, I'm an observer and I'm watching the mempool for a transaction that I know is going to a certain contract. Um, I can actually <clears throat> see a transaction come in and try to front run them by submitting the same transaction, but paying a higher gas price. And in a lot of cases, what this means is that the, um, the miners will actually see my transaction that I sent that actually, you know, I, I paid more, right? Um, and have they have an incentive to go actually mine that one before the person who originally submitted it. So, you know, this could be like, um, <clears throat> to give you like a quick example, um, like imagine a contest of sorts where, uh, you know, if you're the first one to submit an answer, then, you know, you get the reward, right? So if I'm watching that contract for the answers and I see that somebody has submitted an answer, I could front run them by taking the answer and then sending my own transaction, but paying higher gas price. So that's something to be aware of as well. Um, integer overflows and, and underflows, so numbers, right? <clears throat> this is uh, very similar to like how your odometer works, right? 
<clears throat> so if you remember old school odometers, I don't, I don't think any like modern day odometers probably do this, but old school odometers used to be able to like run it up past the highest register and it would go back to zero, right? And so this is what an overflow is. And in, um, in, in smart contracts, you have unsigned integers, which are zero to the two to the 256 minus one. Um, so it's a very, very large number. Um, and if you hit that highest register and go past it a little bit, it'll come back down to, you know, one, two, three again. Um, and then same thing for signed integers, but you have negative values. So an example here um, of, a, of, a, of a UINT overflow. Um, let's say you had one and you added two to the 256 minus one to it, you would actually get zero. Um, so what this means is that, you know, if, if there aren't certain security checks in place um, or if there aren't certain um, libraries in place to prevent these kinds of overflows, then you may be able to bypass certain security checks. So, you know, um, let's say that uh, let's say that you had like a time lock, right, on on a on a, on a contract that said, um, you know, this function can't actually be performed for a week or something like that. <clears throat> then, uh, if you were able to overflow that time lock value, you may be able to to roll it back down so it's only like you know the lowest possible time, which you know could be like a few seconds or whatever. Um, denial of service. Uh, so in Ethereum, one of the ways that, that they help prevent massive um, uh, transaction issues is by having a, a gas limit. So the gas limit is there so basically to prevent um, contracts from just running endlessly. And so each block has a certain limit of gas that can actually be performed. So if you have a contract um, that you could actually, uh, you know, basically loop it until it's endlessly, um, uh, basically um, endlessly um, filling up that gas limit, then it would lead to a denial of service issue, which honestly can can come from non-malicious issues too, like like just bad coding. Like if you just had a piece of code that looped endlessly, um, <clears throat> then you, you might hit that gas limit, which will just cause that transaction to revert. Um, and then there's unexpected revert. So if there's functionality that relies on a, fund transfer to be successful like let's say that um that i have taken owner or i i'm like the leader of this game or whatever in this contract and i go to um and, and somebody else tries to bid higher than me to become the new leader and the contract should refund me my initial donation but i stop it from actually happening um just by reverting that payment then i can maintain leadership over that contract so um Another issue to worry about, right? Denial of service. Access control is is honestly, you know, in my opinion, one of the you know most most important things. And honestly, this comes from just you know hit my history with like Active Directory environments and um, you know you know attacking on-prem networks. We look at hierarchy of how um, permission should be delegated, right? All we look at this all all the time, right? Like domain admins and and how how you know um, permissions and and role-based access control, all these things, right? So Smart contracts have a similar um, type of ownership with access control as well. Um, so ownership over a contract typically means that you can do things like transfer assets, maybe you can mint tokens, maybe you can vote, um, maybe you can actually freeze transfers from happening. Um, and by default, the owner is the account that actually deployed it. And you can you can implement various um, libraries to to create these function modifiers, which basically modify a function so that it requires something like an owner to actually um, perform that function. Um, you can also uh, you know a lot of times can um, find that if there are certain vulnerabilities, maybe you can actually pass off um, that ownership to somebody else or trick the contract into transferring that ownership. Um, because if that's the case, then me as an attacker take ownership over the over the contract, perform um, administrative functionality on the contract, uh, like either just straight up destroying it or sending sending tokens um, or whatever funds are in the contract externally. Um, these are these are things to look at as well when it comes to um, vulnerable code, right? So as as you're kind of auditing different contracts, looking for things like like this, this function here, this function, this follow-up function, where um, the owner equals the message sender. Um, it's a very simple thing. If you call that and you're the 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 one who sent the transaction, it makes you the owner of that specific uh, contract. <clears throat> 
timestamp dependence. <clears throat> so this is another, another issue. So this occurs from a misunderstanding of timekeeping in smart contracts. Um, so block timestamps. So I didn't get into like, you know, the the you know the deep uh like what is blockchain and how are blocks formed and all that stuff um but in in ethereum um you have blocks of transactions that get grouped together and then they get processed by the network um they get mined and then whenever those get validated and posted back to the the network um they get a timestamp so whenever the miner actually posts a block to the network it will they can give it a timestamp and in addition to that, they get a block number. So the block numbers are sequential. Um, these are things that you can use to kind of um, trigger time-based things in contracts. Uh, but time stamps, on the other hand, have an issue where um, the miners can actually modify uh, by certain by certain degree um, the actual time. So they can actually make it look, you know, a few seconds in the future, um, or they can modify it enough to change a result. So an example of, of why this would be something that would be useful. Um, so let's say you had you know another a game or whatever where um, the last person to join wins, right? Then miners could modify the block time to a later date so they win, right? So they they could actually say like I'm going to be a participant in this this contest. I'm going to I'm actually gonna mine my block um, and make it look like it came a little later. Uh, but you know like this is that's just a, another example, but um, there are there are a ton of other issues that are still being found all the time. These are just some kind of just to throw at you today, just to kind of show you, hey, here's some of the things that that are happening, and um, here's some of the issues. So, with that being said, you know functions that appear secure on their own may also turn into really critical issues when you combine them with other functions that are you know are they also on their own look secure. This has been something that has happened to a few different. Um, a few different cases. And I'm gonna walk through a couple of case studies here where um, you may have a function like on its own, if you audit the code by itself, it's like, oh yeah, this is this is fine. Um, and then you have this other function, oh yeah, it looks fine. But the second you combine them, um, whether it's just a reference to the other one, you may start to um, to to implement new issues. So if you wanna look into some more, some more uh, smart contract vulnerabilities, there's a couple of links here on this slide. All right, let's go through some case studies. All right, so the first one I'm going to talk about here is Uranium Finance. <clears throat> um, so this was in April. This was a $57 million uh, pack. <laughs> um, and so Uranium was a clone of uh, a, a decentralized finance site called Uniswap, um, except they did it on the Binance Smart Chain. And remember earlier when I was talking about decentralized finance, like this, the whole idea here is that you have like this that facilitates peer-to-peer um, -peer transactions, right? Where you don't actually have to um, <clears throat> deal with a middleman. So in this case, um, and this is honestly, this is a common thing um, where projects will actually copy code from other people. Um, like, you know, don't ever say you didn't copy code from Stack Overflow <laughs> because this is this is a very common occurrence, right? Like people copy code all the time. And there's something to be said for um, you know reusing previously audited, previously examined code, right? So like if there's code out there that's already been audited, that's already um, you know been analyzed for issues, um, there's there's probably a less chance that it's going to have vulnerabilities. But the second you start modifying it, you need to be real careful, right? So this particular um, <clears throat> project, they they modified portions of this swap function. And if you look at the screenshot I have here, they basically changed some numbers. They they changed um, 1,000 to 10,000 as a balance check in the contract, um, except they missed one location. So they modified it in these two places with the, the purple there. But in the red, you see they actually left 1,000 instead of modifying that one to 10,000. So literally, it, this, this problem came because of a misplaced zero. Um, so an attacker was able to deposit funds um, <clears throat> into this particular token pair, and then um, exploiting that misplay zero was able to drain the entire thing. So literally, a zero caused that problem. Um, Poly Network. This is this is the big one that happened um, last month. So six hundred ten million dollars stolen. Um, Poly Network enables. Um, so the, the whole the whole idea about around Poly is they enable cross chain transactions. Um, so this is 
you know, it facilitates peer-to-peer -peer transactions across different blockchains. So like Ethereum to Binance Smart Chain to Polygon, um, you can actually transact across these different blockchains. And with Poly, they have these things called keepers. So the keepers um, are these trusted entities. So these are back to the access control we talked about, um, the access control issue. These are the trusted entities for those cross-chain transactions. So the way it works is that a user sends a transaction on one blockchain, and then it gets repeated on a destination blockchain. And the way that actually is, is allowed is you have these keepers that sign the block on the source blockchain. So these you know official keeper accounts, right? They, they see a transaction happen on one blockchain, they sign it, then the user submits that signed block to um, this contract on the destination blockchain called the ETH cross-chain manager. When that block gets submitted to the ETH cross-chain manager, if the signature is valid, so if the keeper officially signed that block, um, then the contract on the destination blockchain will actually um, transact that, that um They'll, they'll make that transaction for the user that they wanted on the destination blockchain. But the thing is, is that the execution happens as the ETH cross-chain manager contract, not as the user accounts, uh, not as the, the actual user account themselves. It happens as the, the actual ETH cross-chain manager contract. Why this, is a, why this was a problem <laughs> is because the ETH cross-chain manager actually had permission to change keepers because they were an owner over the ETH cross-chain data contract. So another contract within this network of contracts um, was able to be modified so that um, the attacker could actually exploit it and make themselves a keeper. So they were actually able to figure out that if they submitted a transaction um, using, using the correct uh, payload, they could actually change the keeper over this contract to their own account. And after they did this, they, they, you know, they could then sign fake blocks and send these arbitrary transactions that ultimately resulted in $610 million being stolen. So kind of a sidetrack thought here, but this is another kind of really interesting piece to this entire puzzle is that they returned all of it. <laughs> Which, and honestly, it's a really bizarre thing. It's something that I, I've seen happen multiple times now um, with, with different hacks is the, the hackers um, go and, you know, they exploit a contract, they steal all the funds and they return it, which, you know, who knows why. Um, but this particular case I want to bring up because um, it's interesting because, you know, a lot of people say, oh yeah, you know, blockchain's anonymous. Like, you know, there's no way you'd ever track anything. Uh, but the thing is, is like this, this hacker that, that um, stole $610 million prior to the hack, they sent a transaction from a Chinese exchange called who.com to their wallet. And, um, you know, this is something you can see on the blockchain. So it becomes a question of, okay, whose account is this at who.com? So who knows if they got tracked on that way or, or what, or maybe they just got spooked, you know, that, that maybe they screwed up and left this out there, who knows? Um, but it's just another interesting element to the puzzle. This one happened um, <clears throat> just a couple of weeks ago, Cream Finance. Um, in, <laughs> so this is an $18.8 .8 million uh, stolen. Um, Cream Finance is a decentralized lending protocol. And one of the things they, they do is uh, what's called flash loans. And flash loans are another really popular um, thing in smart contracts. So what are, what are flash loans? Flash loans are the ability for an, a, a contract to provide funds to a user um, in, a, in a single transaction. So um, you could actually request like, you know, a million dollars or whatever as, as a loan. But the, the caveat is that you have to return it in that exact same transaction. And programmatically, um, you know, this is actually looked at from a programmatic level to validate that you're actually going to return that fund. If not, that transaction actually gets reverted. So um, this is something that, you know, um, like arbitragers, uh, so people that deal like arbitrage, which is like, um, so like, let's say that I had like BHIS coin or whatever, right? And it was $5 on one exchange and $6 on another exchange. I could go... Um, you know, buy for five dollars on this exchange, and then go sell for six dollars on this other exchange. So there's a lot of arbitragers that pull a flash loan. They'll go try to do that that exact thing within one transaction, and then return it. Um, so one of the things with with this particular hack that's kind of interesting <clears throat> is that they they did have an audit performed prior to to getting hacked, and 
the thing is that the vulnerable code got introduced after their audit. So, um, you know, if you're going to get a, a code audit, don't go adding stuff that, you know, you haven't actually audited as well. Um, because what happened is they, they implemented a new token. Because, all right, so remember with decentralized finance, you have these token pairs where you can actually trade different, um, different coins and tokens directly um, within the contract context itself. So they implemented this token pair for AMP token. Now, the thing about AMP token is that the contract associated with AMP token is an ERC-777 um, contract. And so ERC-777 is another uh, protocol contract a, a spec that actually has these hooks that allow um, you to call the sender and receiver contracts within the contract itself. So whenever they implemented that, they actually introduced a reentrancy vulnerability. So we talked about reentrancy earlier, um, but they 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 they, they um, introduces this, this vulnerability after adding in this token pair contract. So it allowed an attacker to actually nest a second um, borrow function into the transfer function um, before it's actually updated. And so this is what this is what it looks like um, when you actually kind of um, abstract yourself out to each transaction layer for this particular issue. So the attacker flash loan borrows 500 ETH, uses it as collateral to borrow 19 million AMP. Um, then they exploit reentrancy on the initial contract to borrow 355 more ETH um, before that initial borrow is updated. So they were able to go liquidate the, the tokens that they had borrowed, use that, that, pay, that as payment to repay the contract. Because remember with flash loans, you actually have to go back and pay back what you borrowed. Um, and so the attacker figured out, oh, I could re-enter the contract, extract more, pay back my initial fee, and I'd be left over with um, some extra ETH and AMP tokens. So they did that. 17 times, which ultimately resulted um, in 5.98 thousand Ethereums with 18.8 uh, .8 million dollars. All right. Oh wow, we are getting short on time here. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to run through a demo. Um, this setup for this demo, I'm going to be using um, Ganache, which uh, is a, basically a personal kind of Ethereum blockchain um, hosted on a virtual machine. Um, I'm going to be using Truffle which is a development framework for Ethereum. I'm going to show you Remix IDE, which is a web-based IDE for writing and deploying smart contracts. I'm going to use MetaMask um, to help facilitate sending transactions. And then um, Damn Vulnerable DeFi. So this particular example comes from a, uh, a project that was built to help with understanding vulnerabilities in smart contracts. And um, <clears throat> so throughout this process, I built a, a new kind of quick start guide for if you want to jump in and start hacking smart contracts um this this guide should help you get set up with the same stuff um that you see today so this is uh start.blockchainhacks.com um new quick start guide for you guys to check out all right so let me go to the demo all right so i'm gonna go through this a little bit quickly because we are running kind of short on time here um but uh I'm going to try to give you the best example of what this is, what's going on here. Um, all right, so we have a contract. Um, we have it's a, a a lending pool similar to what we just talked about um, with the flash loans. So it has a single uh, function here called flash loan, and so this flash loan function takes an external input <clears throat> from 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 a um, uh, from anyone who calls this particular function, and in this function we have a borrow amount. So that's how much we want to borrow. Um, we have the actual borrower address. Um, we have a target. Um, and then we have call data. So if you go down to the code um, within the smart contract, um, you'll see that first off, they get the initial balance of the pool um, because they're going to check that later on. right? So they want to make sure that whenever the person takes out a flash loan, they return it all at the end. So they have to get the initial balance. Then we have a transfer function where they transfer the token. right? So they, they send the damn valuable token. Um, to the borrower, specifying the borrow amount. Then on, on success, um, or I'm sorry, then they're going to call. They, this is this is the part where the vulnerability is actually right. So um, it's going to call uh, a target address that we can specify. Um, so if you look at the parameters back up here, right, this address here, we can actually specify this address. So we can actually specify this target that is going to be called and the data that is sent along with that call. And if that's successful, um, then um, it'll pass the next check, which is this require statement. So it must require success to get past the spot. And then ultimately, it's going to check the balance to make sure that you paid it back, right? So um, all right, let's look at some of the exploit code now. 
So this is, remember what I mentioned earlier is that as an attacker, you know, we can deploy our own contracts, right? <clears throat> so this is us deploying our own exploit contract. And in this case, um, I'm just calling it flash exploit. So first off here, we are going to set the addresses for the pool um, that we're going to be attacking. And we're also going to set the, the, the ERC20 token address of the token that is associated um, with the, the pair that we want to actually steal. And then um, here, we're going to specify the data payload that we're going to send. Now, here's the thing. Um, with, with this particular contract, they're, in, um, they're importing the ERC20 uh, token contract as well. And because that ERC20 token contract has been imported, um, we can actually interact with it from the contract itself. So the thing that's, that is really important here is that Whenever this call happens, this call is actually happening. Um, it's originating from the pool contract itself, right? So the pool contract, when we actually call this function, um, we'll send um, the data that we specify to wherever we want it to go. Um, and because they had imported the ERC20 contract, we can actually send um, <clears throat> a payload that says, approve our attacker contract address as a sender of this token. Um, and then we're going to call the flash loan function. We're going to specify zero. Um, like We're not going to try to borrow anything because we don't want to have to worry about like returning um, any values or anything like that. Um, so if we just specify zero, then you know it's going to succeed because there is no, there is no um, necessity for returning it. We're going to specify our attacker contract. We're going to specify the, um, the token contract itself, and then the data that will ultimately approve us as a sender of that token. And then finally, we're going to transfer. Um, we're going to call. We're going to call the token contract directly to transfer tokens from the target pool to our attacker um, wallet. So let's see how that looks. So I've got um, Ganache here. So this is Ganache. Um, this is this is what I mentioned as kind of like your own um, private blockchain, right? Um, so here we can spin up a number of accounts. I've spun up um, ten different Ethereum accounts here. Uh, all with 100 ETH. This first one I used to deploy the contract. So, you know, remember when you deploy contracts, it actually does cost gas. So I'm going to grab um, the private key here of this account, and we're going to use that as our attacker account. So if we go back to um, MetaMask here, let's go ahead and add that one in. So we will import accounts. Then we're going to paste the key in, import, um, and yay, we have 100 ETH. Um, so additionally, let's go ahead and add the token in um, so that we can actually see the token pair. So I'm going to go back to Ganache. I'm going to go to the Contracts tab in Ganache. I'm going to go to the damn valuable token here. I'm going to grab the address. <laughs> and then um, we're going to add that in as a token pair. So you can see it already picked up the, the ticker address, DVT. Um, we're going to add that. We don't have any current DVT in our account. So let's go look at the, the contract real quick um, and what, what the, the account values are there. So if we go Trouble Console, um, we can interact directly with that contract and, and well, with, with Ganache directly. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I apologize. We're going to kind of go over here a bit. Um, I hope Jason's not mad. <laughs> not mad at all, Bo. OK. I, I told you before, like, I was going to kind of YOLO the time on this, so I apologize. <laughs> I didn't actually um, you know, time any of this. <laughs> all right, so uh, we're going to first off, we're going to we're going to get the, the token um, contract into a variable. Um, we're going to get the pool into a variable. Um, so trust your lender pool uh, dot deployed. So these are both the deployed contracts. Like we have the token contract that has the damn valuable tokens, and we have the pool that also implements a swap or the flash loan functionality um, of that token. So now um, what we can do is look at the token balance of the of the um, of the pool, so we can kind of see what what the balance looks like there. And we get this value back, right? It's kind of crazy looking. Like, what is that? <laughs> so that is in um, what's called big number format. Um, we can actually use Web3 utils to, to actually bring that back to a um, decimal number. So we can add in the 
value there. And we get one E plus 24. What that means is one followed by 24 zeros. And why, why does it have 24 zeros? So um, our token, the damn valuable token has 18 decimal places. And so 24 minus 18, you get this, you get six, which means we have six zeros, um, which is a total of 1 million tokens. So this contract has 1 million tokens currently. Um, let's check our attacker address real quick. We should, like I said, um, we should have zero there. So let's um, grab that, come back over to the terminal. Um, we will do token.balance of, um, we will put our attacker address in there and we get zero, right? So currently our attacker address has no tokens, right? Um, so let's let's go exploit this contract now. So I showed you the, the exploit code here. So now as this account, um, as the, as the um, the attacker contract um, in Remix here in the IDE, we can use injected Web three um, environment, which basically will connect to MetaMask, which our MetaMask wallet is connected to Ganache, our local blockchain. So this will facilitate us being able to deploy this contract um, to our local blockchain. So I'm going to deploy it, and then we get the verification here because um, we have to sign it um, with our account to send this transaction. Um, so this will deploy the contract, and then once it's deployed, one of the cool things about Remix is that it will actually um, show you the deployed contracts here and allow you to actually interact with the functions. So we can actually specify um, our next uh, the, or the values that we want to, to utilize for this exploit. So I'm going to send a borrow amount of zero. I'm going to send an attacker address of our own because ultimately our exploit is going to send tokens to our attacker address. So let's go ahead and specify that. Then we're going to need the target pool and the token address. So we've got the token address here. And then the pool address, contracts tab, um, trust or lender pool. So that's the address of the pool. We're targeting and transact. So now, this is us interacting directly with the exploit contract that we just published. Um, and when we interact with that, we're sending this transaction that's basically saying, hey, make this attacker contract um, have approval to send tokens from that pool because they had an issue, right? They have a vulnerability. So now if we go look at our wallet, our MetaMask wallet, we should see that we have a million DVT. <laughs> so we have we've successfully exploited this particular pool. Um, if we go back to the console um, and check the balance of the pool, we should see that it is now zero. So we've drained the pool of the uh, the DBT tokens. All right. So that's the demo. <laughs> Let's get back to the the slides real quick because I have a couple more slides I want to get to and then um, we'll wrap it up. So. All right, so just a quick recap of what we just did. Um, identified the vulnerability in smart contract. We deployed our own malicious contract. They called the vulnerable function in the target contract. We called the exploit function in our own malicious contract, um, specifying the target. And then um, that, that exploit actually set our attacker contract as an approved sender of the ERC-20 token from the pool. And then the attacker contract then initiates a transfer of all the tokens from the pool to our attacker wallet. All right. So lastly, I'm going to run through just uh, real quickly a few security tools. So if you're like, hey, how do I how do I jump into this? How do I start looking at this? Um, so Visual Studio Code is a really good um, uh, IDE, um, you know, VS Code. People use it for all kinds of purposes, right? So if you go grab the Solidity Visual Developer plugin um, or um, ex uh, extension, then um, that will help you kind of analyze a lot of this stuff too. Um, it will highlight a lot of the syntax, highlights a lot of security issues. It also uses um, Soraya um, for generating call graphs, which is really nice. So things like this, where you have the call graphs um, that kind of show where um, where the different flow is. So like this is that pool we just exploited, right? So you can actually see the flash loan function um, and how it actually calls the ERC-20 contract, the balance of and transfer functions, um, and how we actually call that target uh, call from it. And then um, Slither is another tool. So Solidity Source Code Analyzer. So this is a static uh, analyzer for vulnerabilities in source code. Detects many of the common issues, such as reentrancy, um, functions that allow users to self-destruct the contract, um, has low false positives. Um, it looks kind of like this. Mithril and Mythics. Um, 
So Mithril is an open source uh, tool. It has some, it's does symbolic execution, uh, vulnerability scanning. Can also scan bytecode directly. So if you don't have the source, you actually point it directly at bytecode. Um, MythX is a paid service um, that you can go subscribe to um, and have it do longer, more in-depth scans. Um, in that, in that, um, that quick start guide that I I, I put together, the start quick start. I'm sorry, start.blockchainhacks.com. Um, I've got a few quick examples at the end of it for using Slytherin Mithril. And then some additional research to get started. Um, <clears throat> so books, I cannot recommend uh, more um, the Mastering Ethereum book. I absolutely love this book. Um, I think it's a great, um, like if you want to jump in and really understand like what is Ethereum, what are smart contracts, and like what are some of the issues, um, go grab this book. And it is also, yeah, like the entire book is open source on GitHub. So, that, you know, you, you don't even have to buy it. <laughs> um, and then hands-on smart contract development book is another good one. Um, learning Solidity. So, you know, I showed you a couple tools there um, on the last couple slides, um, but actually learning Solidity code itself is going to help more than anything to identify these issues. So CryptoZombies.io is a free um, dApp building game that um, is phenomenal. Um, so that will walk you through creating a decentralized application. Um, CTFs. So, you know, for me, this is how I learn best, um, to be honest, is, is getting put in like a CTF environment where I have to, I'm kind of forced to learn something new. Um, Ethernaut and Damn Vulnerable DeFi are both really good uh, CTF-like environments. Bug bounties. So if you're into bug bounties, there's a huge bug bounty market on um, smart contracts. And this is this is a really good reason to go and learn this stuff because some of the some of the bounties themselves are like a million dollars. Um, they're they're crazy. So um, check out some of these the, the bug bounties that are out there. And then I'll do some key takeaways here at the end um, to leave you with. Um, so, you know, I started out with, um, you know, talking about a few of the use cases, right? So use cases for blockchain are growing significantly. A lot of companies are implementing it. Um, a lot of projects are racing to be at the front. Um, any of the hacks that are happening currently are, are resulting in a significant loss of funds. Since this is kind of, you know, still an emerging technology, New smart contract vulnerabilities are still being discovered, um, and it's something that we're going to continue to find more and more of. So um, it's something we need to be we need to be performing uh, often. Security analyzers are good, so like actual like software vulnerability standards are, are great to to uh, you know get kind of like a high level view. But just understand that um, at the end of the day, understanding what the code's actually doing is going to be far more valuable than um, than just you know running a scanner. Like you have to understand what it's doing, or you're going to miss something. Um, smart contracts are only one piece of this growing blockchain ecosystem. Um, you know, I showed you a slide earlier talking about layer one, layer two, wallet software. All of these things are additional things on top of this that we're going to have to start looking at uh, more and more of. So with that, <clears throat> that's the end. Um, follow me on Twitter. I'm a Daft Hack on Twitter. Um, put together that blockchain hacks quick start guide. So if you if you're like Wow, I want to go hack some smart contracts today. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> um, this uh, this quick start guide should get you started with um, setting up an environment similar to what I just demoed. Um, and then we do the CoinSec podcast, which is weekly um, about blockchain security. So if you're like, I want to hear about the latest hacks, um, be sure to go check out the CoinSec podcast. Um, and yeah, if you need a smart contract audit, um, Black Hills Infosec, um, we're doing them now. <laughs> Thank you, Bo. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, I'm gonna do you feel do you feel like you understand better? Nah, I gotta rewatch it. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's just me though. That's no one else. I will rewatch it. Uh, there was a few comments, you know, like during this is like, how did you fit all this information in your head, and when did you get started learning this? <laughs> um, I guess like eight years ago. You know, like I started mining Bitcoin like eight years ago. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those, like, when should you plant the tree or when should you start learning Bitcoin, you know, eight years ago or today? Like, it's one of those things. Well, so, you know, think about it this way. There's only one country in the world that has adopted Bitcoin as a legal currency, you know? So there's still a lot, a lot of other room to grow. Um, I'm not saying that, you know, obviously that Bitcoin is going to be like the only one that does it, but it is something that is still very much in an infancy stage. And I see it as... Um, so I mean, it's only going to grow more. You know, I think that um, this industry is is booming, um, and I don't know. I, I think that I think it's it's worth learning <laughs> for for sure. You know, I don't think it's going away anytime soon. Uh, I'm looking for questions right now, and oh yeah, uh, it, this one came up a lot, and so just uh, and he covered it here at the end. But like, 
if you were going to get started today, what's the first thing that you would do? Um, so I, I guess it depends on what your your purpose is, right? Like, what do you want to do? Because, like I mentioned, there's there's a number of different elements um, to to the entire blockchain world, right? So, you, like. There's wallets, there's mining, there's um, you know, there's smart contracts, there's all these things. Right now, I would say that the brunt of security issues um, are in the smart contract space. So learning smart contracts, if you wanna if you wanna dive into like probably the biggest, riskiest area where hacks are happening, where bug bounties are, where um, you know, organizations are trying to figure out how to make these things work and not lose millions of dollars. I would say smart contracts is the place to start. And to get started with smart contracts, honestly, understanding Ethereum uh, first and understanding what Ethereum is, how does the blockchain work? Um, <clears throat> because ultimately smart contracts are deployed on top of Ethereum. And to truly understand what a smart contract is doing, you kind of have to understand like, what is the blockchain doing? <laughs> uh, I got a quick question that I got to run and then Ralph, I'll have you take over. Uh, Bo. Well, on your CoinSec podcast, do you have people that ask questions and then you engage and respond, or is it just you guys talk and people listen? Yeah, I mean, if people show up and they ask questions, um, yeah, I mean, we need people to show up though first. <laughs> okay. uh, so when people show up, yeah. if you have like a series of questions, or today you rewatch the recording, like like this, some becomes something like this. Today's the spark. This is when the seed was planted, and I would say the CoinSec podcast is where you just go next, and it's, you guys are going to keep doing it. Is it every week or bi-weekly? Yep. Yeah, every week. Yeah. Awesome. So I'm going to leave. That means Ralph at the very end, you get to end the webinar for all. Uh, but if you want to stick around for like five to 10 more minutes while you all answer questions, but I got to go pick up my daughter from school. So I will see you all later. All right. See you, Jason. Hi, right, Jason. All right. Awesome presentation, buddy. Thanks, man. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, I was looking at to see if there's any other questions in the chat, at least in discord i think i didn't see any other ones i think i did see one question about um thoughts on the uh algo Alg algorand network uh have you looked into algo smart contracts um i haven't looked into it specifically no yeah i actually haven't heard of that one either um but these things pop up like crazy fast so mm -hmm. um yeah it's kind of like you know what i was mentioning about um <clears throat> how there's so many co competitors right like there's so, you know like one of the things with Bitcoin is that it it's kind of made itself the you know it, like the whole purpose of Bitcoin is currency, right? Like that's that's its prime purpose. But now you have a lot of other um, blockchain technologies like Ethereum, Solana, Cardano, um, all yeah. these other ones that are implementing smart contracts, and they're all trying to figure out who, who like what's the best way to do it, what's the most efficient way. Like we didn't even talk about consensus algorithms. Like I didn't even talk about like you know proof of work versus proof of stake. Um, you know, all of these different ways you can actually do consensus. Like that's another, like maybe we should do another webcast just on <laughs> things. Yeah. Just like, uh, what do you call it? Um, blockchain 101, right? Cause I mean, this, this class was, uh, or this talk is really focused on security, right? Like, mm -hmm. Hey, this is there. It's not just, but you know, the, if we take that even one step back, right. Cause you know, the security is kind of like the higher level side of that. Mm -hmm. Like why why like the you know yeah. that you know trying to answer that question why do this why you know, why blockchain right you know buzzword out so um i see yeah. a question um so do logic bugs and eth convey to other chains yeah so that's actually a really good question <clears throat> and so a number of projects have actually forked ethereum um and they're actually really popular so things like finance smart chain <laughs> yep. um and and so with finance smart chain you have contracts that are written on Solidity too. Um, so yeah, absolutely. You know, vulnerabilities. There's actually um, so the the vulnerability from a couple of weeks ago that was in uh, Geeth. Um, that one was a major one, right? And it actually caused a fork in Ethereum. And that one, because Ethereum was vulnerable, um, it, because or I'm sorry, because Geeth was vulnerable, a lot of the other projects that had forked off of Ethereum also forked Geeth for their own projects. So those projects ended up having the same issue as well. So yeah, yeah, they definitely, <laughs> they definitely uh, kind of cascade down. Yeah, th there's there's a bunch too, and and they're they're trying to ride the wave of uh, you know um, the already existing spark contracts, so you don't have to rewrite them, right? Yeah. Um, and again, to your point, right? You just brought that up. Copy pasta. I made a change. Uh oh, you know we lost our money. 
So. Mm -hmm. So yeah, most of the questions we had on GoToWebinar were how do we get started? We had a lot of people interested, especially uh, people in the InfoSec industry who were looking to maybe switch and look into this. So that's good. Sweet. I think they're that's in the awesome. right place. Yep. Yeah. Sweet. That's really cool. Uh, I see one. Do you think blockchain technology will be the next after cloud technology? Do you think it's the next big thing? Um, I wouldn't put it in the same spectrum as cloud. I think, I think, um, I mean, it's, it's different, right? It's, it's an industry of itself. Um, it's hard to say, you know, like where the future will take it, you know, like, you know, 10 years to, uh, you know, 50 years from now, um, it's hard to say for sure. Um, you know, who knows? I mean, maybe technology will advance so far where that you can, you know, efficiently run a full node on a phone, you know? Um, in which case you're interacting with applications on your own phone at that point and not having to deal with like a centralized entity at all. Um, you know, so, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think it'll ever, I mean, in the near future, take like the cloud spectrum. <laughs> um, but, you know, who knows where the future will take it. Sure. We had one more technical, I guess, uh, question in GoToWebinar was why Solidity 0.6.12 still in use for new contracts? Um, That's a yeah. So, you know, most most contracts should. Um, so, so what that question is referring to is the compiler version. Um, so, if we go back. I'll go back to the slide real quick where we saw that demo or that uh, example contract. Um, Here, actually, I think this one has it here. Oh, here, you know, let me just <laughs> go back to PowerPoint. This will be easier. Um, so in the example here, oh, I could click correctly. There it is. Um, so in the example here, so at the top here, we have the, the pragma, the solidity uh, 0 0.6.4. So that's what mm -hmm. that's what that question was referring to is the, the solidity compiler version. Um, so the compiler versions, you know, get updated with certain protections as well. Um, they add different, um, uh, requirements. So, like for example, if there was a vulnerability that occurred where, um, you know, there was a piece of code like um, like a fallback function or a constructor where it was named in a in an ambiguous way that led to vulnerabilities, then maybe they updated the compiler um, to make it stand out as an issue, right? So the compiler will just tell you, hey, you're using something that is vulnerable, right? Mm -hmm. um, so most projects should be using the latest compiler. Right, they should be using the latest compiler to help understand a lot of those issues. Right, there may be some backwards compatibility issues with certain things that people are doing on the network, right? That they need a specific version for. But yeah, it's a good question. Cool. Um, well, I think that's probably good. Um, if uh, if you guys have any more questions, you know, feel free to DM me. Um, <clears throat> you know, again, you know, check out the podcast and. Uh, yeah, um, looking forward to doing some 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 more of these. Um, I think I think there's definitely room for doing a few more webcasts like this. So. Oh yeah, I think a one on one would be pretty awesome. So last question before we go, Bo. I only can buy one coin. Which one am I going to buy? No, nope, not going to say no. it. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had to end it on that one. Well, hey everyone, thank you for uh, watching our webcast, uh, Bo. Thanks for doing this. This is awesome stuff. Hopefully, we can do some more of it. And I. I'm going to end the webinar, but it'll take me one second because I have to find out where that button is uh, to end the <laughs> webinar. Uh, I think I avoided that. All right, thanks that. everyone. All right, later guys. Appreciate you all coming.